Welcome everyone. We're just going to wait as attendees continue to arrive. Just sit tight. So we've got a few people here. I'll just start with uh, some of the housekeeping stuff and then I'll introduce the panelists. Um, hello everyone, welcome to the Public Interest Environmental Law Conference. Thank you for joining us for this panel on the youth-led movement to obtain an International Court of Justice advisory opinion on climate change. My name is Kieran Gay and I will be moderating this panel. I have just a few announcements and then we'll get started. Um, firstly, there's a tech warning. So. Um, don't worry if you can't see yourself, this is a Zoom webinar, so all of the attendees are automatically muted with videos off, so you'll only be able to see the panelists. Also throughout the panel, um, if you have a question, please use the Q&A function and, and our panelists will complete the presentation and then there'll be a Q&A session at the end um, where they can answer any questions you might have, but feel free to send those as we go. Uh, and also during the panel, we will be sending out a link through the Q&A function containing instructions on how to do the following. Firstly, for legal professionals in the audience, there will be instructions on how to obtain CLE credit for your attendance. And it will also contain instructions on how to donate to our alumni board, Friends of Land Air Water, which provides stipends for students doing unpaid public interest environmental law internships. So look out for that link while the panelists are speaking. Um, <clears throat> Lastly, the University of Oregon is located on Kalapuya Ilahi, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed from the coast reservation in Western Oregon, oh, to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron, Community of Oregon, and the Confederated Tribes of Silets, Indians of Oregon, and continue to make important contributions in their communities at UO and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. Pilk would like to acknowledge the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya peoples in the Willamette Valley and express our respect for the indigenous nations of Oregon. We will now introduce our panelists. Um, Aditi is an environmental lawyer based in the UK. She graduated with an LLM in Global Environmental Law and Governance from the University of Strathclyde, Glasgow. She has practiced as a lawyer in India. Currently, she works as a research fellow with the Ozone Secretariat UNEP and an executive assistant, assistant with the Climate Change Specialist Group um, with WCEL IUCN. Um, with World Youth for Climate Justice, she is an academic collaborator and part of the steering team for the NGO and also contributes to the Asian Front. Um, Hemet, based in Sri Lanka, is a wildlife photographer, writer, and student currently pursuing a bachelor's degree in environmental studies at OP Jindal Global University, India. Um, for World Youth for Climate Justice, he plays a role in steering um, in the steering committee as a member of engagement coordinator and can contributes to the Asian front as well as the academic task force. Um, Manon is an environmental lawyer based in the UK. She graduated with an LLM in Global Environmental Law and Governments from the University of Strathclyde, Glasgow. She works as a consultant in environmental law at Living Law Scotland and is an executive assistant with the Climate Change Specialist Group with WCL and IUCN. With World um, Youth for Climate Justice, she is an academic coordinator and part of the steering team for the organization and also contributes to the European front. Lastly, Robin Happel um, is an environmental law student at Yale University. Throughout law school, Robin has collaborated both with Pacific Island students fighting climate change on emerging um, climate litigation pathways and with divest, invest, and protect on climate risk indigenous rights issues. Robin um, previously worked with the Bronx Zoo, the UN Environment um, Program Major Group of Children and Youth, and Clean Cooking Alliance, um, and other NGOs devoted to sustainable development. Robin has also uh, presented the, at the UN Association at the 2020 High Level Political Forum, the UN Youth Climate Summit, and the UN uh, Global Climate Action Summit. I will now turn things over to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you for that, Karen, uh, for the introductions. Um, before we get started, Aditi, could you please um, share a screen with the presentation? 
Thank you. Um, in the meanwhile, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. I understand it's 8 a.m. PST, so thank you for taking the time out of your Sunday mornings. Um, so yeah, thanks for joining us uh, for World Youth for Climate Justice's panel in the University of Oregon's PIELC conference. Oh, conference yeah. So today we're going to outline our campaign in seeking an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on the global crime, climate crisis. Uh, we're basically going to emphasize the urgent and existential threat this crisis poses to not just youth worldwide, but everybody in the present and the future. And on that note, let's get started, shall we? Um, Aditi, next slide, please. So um, who are we? World's Youth for Climate Justice, or WYCJ, is an NGO that campaigns to take climate change and human rights to the International Court of Justice, or ICJ, to seek an advisory opinion, or an AO. It seeks to clarify the obligations of states to protect the rights of current and future generations from the adverse effects of climate change. And the core themes of the advisory opinion we're seeking revolve around climate justice, intergenerational equity, and human rights as well. So what are we doing or what is WICJ? It's an umbrella organization for the various partners and organizations working on climate justice issues across the world. Um, we work in partnership with the Pacific Island Students Fighting for Climate Change, or PISFCC, um, which was established when a group of students from the Pacific came together to move the ICJ for the AO, and thus were the initiators of, the camp of this campaign. They took the first step, which is often the hardest thing to do, but so far it's progressed pretty cool, pretty well. Um, this campaign, the campaign advocacy revolves around the need to provide an understanding of a rights-based approach to address the climate crisis crisis, and also the need to utilize international legal mechanisms to clarify and develop the international environmental law in cons uh, alongside with humanitarian law. Um, we also published a legal report in July 2021, which elaborates why and how an advisory opinion from the ICJ is a well-justified avenue to advance uh, this development and um, complement the UNFCCC negotiations and the broader climate goals at the community, national, regional, and international level. And if you'd like to look at the report, just check our website. Um, so why do we do what we do? Well, the climate crisis infringes on the ability to exercise uh, human rights. Um, global, heat, uh, global warming, sea level rise, more frequent and intense extreme weather events, and biodiversity decline do not happen in a vacuum. It has to be some driving force behind them. Um, desertification, air pollution, coastal erosion, coral bleaching, and loss of freshwater resources are just some of the climate crisis impacts that are now directly infringing on the basic human rights of people living in communities on the front line of the climate crisis. Uh, and they're already being violated now as, as we speak. Vulnerable groups such as women, children, indigenous populations, the elderly, people living on the front line, and other marginalized demographics are facing the brunt of this crisis. And yeah, in our eyes, it doesn't seem fair if one contributes the least to the climate crisis, but experiences its worst impacts. I, mean, I think we can all agree on the fact that it isn't fair. Um, but so far, status contributions have not been ambitious enough to reach the 1.5 degree target agreed upon in Paris. Um, oh, sorry, I missed a paragraph, but uh, a global society continues to implement sustainable solutions at no more than a glacial pace. Uh, so in 2011, the climate vulnerable Pacific Island state of Palau attempted to take climate change to the International Court of Justice. They were seeking clarifications on the obligations of states to cut greenhouse gas emissions to avoid transboundary harm. Palau's attempts were unfortunately unsuccessful. And a few years later, states from all over the world came together for the Paris Agreement, inviting states to voluntarily commit to emission reduction targets. But so far, states' contributions have not been ambitious enough to reach the 1.5 degree target agreed upon in Paris. In 2019, 27 law students from the University of the South Pacific were inspired by Palau's initiative and came together to form the Pacific Island Students Fighting Climate Change. They built upon Palau's campaign with a new focus, which was human rights and climate change. Uh, and although a crucial step in the right direction, in order for this resolution to be successful, there has to be a simple majority vote by the member states of the UN. Um, and recognizing this reality, the ICJAO campaign has grown beyond the Pacific, where Pacific youth and partners are working tirelessly to galvanize support both regionally and internationally. 
youth from around the world have united in this mission under the youth-led umbrella organization, which is us. And we do not accept the fate of an unjust, unequal, unsustainable future. And with this ICJAO campaign signals to the world a concrete and well-justified catalyzer for more ambitious climate action. Um, and yeah, now uh, the, uh, talking about talking a bit more about the campaign and the road towards the ICJAO. So the first step on this journey to the world's highest court is to campaign on a national and regional level. Here, WICJ seeks to support its members by engaging in training, upskilling sessions, onboarding sessions, and for example, like a storytelling forum. And each national campaign is given full authority to become the driving force behind a national strategy that is appropriate for that context. And needless to mention that successfully reaching for the ICJ is far from a walk in the park. Um, and the process is, comple is complex, uncertain, intrinsically dependent on the political will, and several aspects have to be taken into account in order to reach that goal. Um, one of which is the legal question, which has to be well designed. And however, the legal question um, posed to the court by the UNGA is subject to negotiations as one of the six UNGA committees. And in that context, WICJ argues that the question has to have strong legal grounds while remaining ambitious. And Aditi is gonna speak on that a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, so last year on the 26th of September, I believe, Vanuatu came out and stated that they will ask the International Court of Justice for an advisory opinion um, on the rights of present and future generations to be protected from climate change. Vanuatu is just one of the many Pacific Island nations facing sea level rises worst impacts and climate change will continue to exacerbate the severity of tropical storms. When they stated their intentions, Vanuatu's government said it recognizes that current levels of action and support for vulnerable developing countries within multi multilateral mechanisms are insufficient. In a speech to the UNGA, Vanuatu Prime Minister Bob Lofman reiterated the call for comprehensive global action on climate change. Um, he highlighted the fact that the dire consequences of climate change can no longer be ignored and the science linking climate change to past and present emissions of greenhouse gases is unquestionable. It's already been well established. Um, and this was the first milestone um, achievement for our campaign. Yay. Um, so what these did was give us the extra strength we needed to make this campaign more visible. It amplified the noise our campaign was creating and spread the message and raised awareness. So we now know that there is a state willing to take this forward and we have the backing and support from this state. And I think one example of how this announcement helped us and boosted the campaign was when some of the, uh, the WICJ team went to COP26 in Glasgow. And it's almost like, it's like WICJ walks into Glasgow and everybody's like, oh, you know what, they're, they're the ones seeking the ICJAO. They're the ones who are kind of taking the step forward and things are starting to line up. Um, I think Aditi and Manoa talk, are laughing because I wasn't able to go, so I'm a bit jealous. If I'm, but um, yeah, so the COP, the COP, the campaign in COP was pretty successful. We had a few events; they went brilliantly, and these, like I said, these amplified the voice. This made us; they made the mission and vision a lot louder and clearer. Um, and I hope I wasn't speaking too fast, but now I'm going to. Oh, what we're looking forward to in the next is the 77th session of the UNGA which happens in September this later this year. Um, so another step that we're gonna do is we're gonna, uh, get, we're gonna start getting support and gaining attention in New York itself. This could involve potentially setting up an HQ in New York um, and traveling there for the UNGA. The, the plane tickets are gonna be a bit expensive, but it's a hell of a town and I've always wanted to go there. But it's not a vacation, WICJ is going there to work on the campaign where trying to get everybody to know about the ICJ or climate changes, disastrous impacts on the world, how human anthropocentric activities are exacerbating these effects and how the planet is deteriorating. Um, but that's all from my part. And I'm gonna let Aditi talk a bit more on the ICJ. Oh, Aditi, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Hemad. And um, I am trying to move right now. Uh, 
Um, I'm not sure if I have full screen, but um, just because of paucity of time, I'm going to just gonna continue like this. I hope you can see my screen. And um, yes, so I'm gonna uh, highlight what exactly an advisory opinion is, and um, and may and go into a few legal technical technicalities of it. So the International Court of Justice has two um, primary adju adjudicative functions. One is to resolve international law disputes among sovereign states, and the other is to um, issue an advisory opinion on outstanding legal questions at the request of whatever body authorized by the Charter of the United Nations. Since this is an advisory opinion, um, it is pretty much understood that it's not legally binding on states. However, it does lay down important, uh, important points of law that may be relied on subsequent cases and even in legal education. As uh, my colleague Himmat mentioned earlier about Palau's and Marshall Islands uh, attempt to sort an AO, they exactly sort an AO on uh, clarifying legal, ob uh, legal obligations uh, under international law of states that contribute substantially uh, to GA emissions and cause and consequently cause harm to other states. This uh, did not succeed because among many other reasons, one important reason was that it was not the right question. Learning from Palau's case, uh, we know that it, it is critical to ask the right question. Asking the wrong question um, would, I do not know why my computer is doing this. I'm so sorry. Anyway, asking the wrong question could result in an unhelpful answer from the court. And uh, despite doing so, it does not really guarantee a particular or um, specific outcome because ultimately the International Court of Justice does have a power to interpret the question as it sees fit. Considering the dire need of clarifying this position of international law, its legal relationship with the developing principle of intergenerational equity, as Himbat mentioned earlier as well, and protecting the rights of future generations, WICJ takes this as the basis of the movement and hopes that the International Court of Justice, along uh, with the support of one or two, will be moved to ask such questions. The question that WICJ intends to ask is what are the legal obligations of states under international law to protect the rights of present and future generations against adverse effects of climate change? Now, what can this question exactly do? This question asks the court to consider substantive issues of international law, environmental law, specifically climate change law, and all of this in relation with human rights law, which currently operate in a separate manner. We believe that this uh, AO uh, advisory opinion on climate change law and humanitarian law will not only summarize existing state obligations, but it will deliver a progressive interpretation of principles like intergenerational equity, intergenerational equity, and so on and so forth, and make, uh, make pro global progress towards achieving climate justice generally. Now, coming back to the technicalities and the bureaucratic procedure uh, of taking the UNGA route, the prima facie comp competency of the uh, United Nations General Assembly is to request an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice, which is entailed in Article 65.1 of the ICJ Statute and 96.1 of the UN Charter. As mentioned earlier, also it can ask question any. It can formulate a question which is um, which which has uh, a certain scope, and by making recommendations, this is highlighted or this is provided by Article Ten of the Charter, and by making recommendations, it means that it could entail asking a resolution or tabling a resolution by any state which is party to the UN Charter. And from the entire scope of the, of the charter, it means that it can extend to any issue from international peace and security to international cooperation in solving international problems. As highlighted earlier, and as undeniable as it can be, 
at this point of time, climate change cannot be argued as no, as it's not an international problem. So that is why we seek that this is a good position for us um, with support, obviously, of uh, states and uh, and political will, as mentioned earlier, to take this forward. Also. Uh, another thing with the United Nations General Assembly is that it has a history of putting climate change and human rights issues on its agenda. This can be seen with a series of resolution uh, dating right from 1988, which was called the protection of global climate for present and future generations to certain progressing, progressive ones like harm, uh, harmony with nature. However, as mentioned earlier and emphasizing again this is not enough what is more important is that after negotiations this resolution put forward by any state at this point of time the state of Vanuatu is that it should be successful with a simple majority that is 193 states should have to vote in um, in favor of this resolution for it to then be um, put forward to the International Court of Justice by the UNGA. Very interestingly, what happened at COP26 last year was um, that the government of Antigua and Barbuda and Tuvalu signed an agreement for the establishment of the Commission of Small Island States on climate change and international law. This was done with the intention to seek an advisory opinion from the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, the ITLAS. And at that point, the, these governments further stated that this agreement is an avenue to deal with the loss and damages. While ITLAS is, has a completely different uh, jurisdiction from that of the International Court of Justice, it is very interesting to note and say that these small island developing countries also envision this as a remedy to clarify international legal issues on climate mitigation and adaptation, particularly loss and damage in their case, which are in parallel to the climate negotiations that happen every year. So ultimately, the takeaway point is that we hope that this AO will clarify and be and complement the climate negotiations that take place every year and not um, substitute them. Uh, from this, I will give it over to Manon to further describe the AO, uh, further describe the rights rights based approach. Thank you, Aditi. I hope you can hear me all clearly and well enough. So I am going to elaborate and describe a bit more the ground that was WACJ chose chose, which was the human rights approach to climate to climate justice. As explained before by my colleague, oh, Aditi, I can't see the, uh, the slides. I don't know if it's only me. I can't hear you. You want me to share the screen? I'm to share the screen. Okay. Can you change slides, please? Again. Um. Oh, I'm. I'm gonna keep on going for the sake of the time. Um, as explained before, the process of seeking an advisory opinion before the ICJ is complex, uncertain, and highly political. However, the current scientific, political, and legal development, as those that we have seen at COP26, show that the momentum for such initiative has appeared, both in the sphere of human rights linked with climate justice, and in the sphere of intergenerational e generational equity. By seeking such opinion, from the ICJ, WYCJ hopes to clarify two areas of law. The state's obligation to protect, and it, li and it links with human rights under the international human environmental law framework, as well as the emphasis on the rights of present and future generation that can thus be related to intergenerational equity when facing 
climate change's consequences. The question that we need to address right now is why using human rights based approach to climate change law is relevant and legally well grounded. Firstly, regarding the, connect the connection of climate change and human rights, there are two primary ways in which the connection manifests itself. In the, first, in the first time, in jurisdictions where an autonomous right to a healthy environment is not recognized, courts have noted the impact of climate change on other rights, such as the right of life, the right to private property, the right to health. And second, in the second time, when climate change is a direct and unequivocal threat to the right to a healthy environment for the, uh, that has been recognized in, in such um, legal framework, um, thus, environmental disaster, the deprivation of the enjoyment of a healthy environment, the deprivation of clean water, clean air, of the right to life, and so on, are considered a breach of human well-being score and consequently their human rights. This statement is proven to be even more relevant, as said by my colleagues, in the case of climate change. Climate, climate, climate change being the biggest environmental threat that humans are co currently facing and its negative impacts on the Earth's ecosystem have acknowledged consequences for the human enjoyment of human rights. This has been illustrated by the, late, the most recent IPCC report. Now, what is the definition of a human rights based approach? A human rights based approach is a conceptual framework that is normatively based on inter international human rights standards and operationally direct promoting and protecting human rights. More precisely, it aims to analyze obligation inequalities and vulnerabilities to redress discriminatory practices and unjust distribution of power that impede progress and undercut human rights. Consequently, this approach not only applies to litigation, but can be implemented at every legal and regulatory stage. For instance, during the policymaking process, reviewing process, etc. In the case of, clim of climate change, it is commonly established that at the national level, they are obligated to protect their inhabitants from foreseeable threats related to climate change. At the international level, several obligation obligations linked to climate change, such as the one in, in, bit in the Paris Agreement. And human rights can be derived, especially in the light of inter intergenerational equity. For instance, principle one of the declaration from 1970. These two sets of obligations, therefore, offer basic ground to a human rights-based approach at every regulatory level. This can be, this can be illustrated by the rise of human rights based climate litigation around the world. Indeed, regarding uh, climate litigation based on human rights, several tendencies can be identified from this increase of such litigation that has been developing during the past years. In the first place, we notice case that seeks adequate and adequate response or measures to adapt climate change. On this category, over 80% of such cases are aimed at pressuring government to do more to mitigate climate change. For instance, in 2019, the Dutch Supreme Court held in the Uganda case that the Netherlands' inadequate police, climate policies is a violation of Article 2 and 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights and established that there was a legal duty on a government to prevent dangerous case climate change. Other cases that there, is also, there are also cases that claim the enforcement of existing commitments and targets. The claim is that states cannot respect, protect, and fulfill human rights while breaching legislation they have themselves adopted. For instance, in the case of Legari versus Federation of Pakistan, the High Court held that the right to, to life, the right to human dignity, right to property and the right to information guaranteed by their constitution must now be extended to climate change. We also notice other cases that aim to establish states' obligation to prevent, to protect human rights and when undertaking action on climate change. This focus, 
This focuses on the argument that states' negative obligation required them to ensure that their mitigation and adaptation activities in response to climate change do not themselves contribute to human, viol human rights violation. And finally, another trend is the increase of case against corporation using a human rights-based approach. In the case, more precisely now, of the use of human rights-based approach when youth is involved, it can be concluded that the trend from, bring, from bringing human rights-based climate change is likely to continue as government come under increasing, increasing pressure to do more in, the, in this area. And as courts and rights bodies elucidate and develop the relationship between rights and climate change through case law. Um, in furthermore, on the 8th October 2000, uh, 2021, the UN Human Rights Council voted 20, 42 to 1 in favor of a resolution to recognize the right to a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment as a human right. Therefore, enhancing this global trend of human rights linked with climate change. What is also striking to notice is the increasing number of right-based cases involved as the one shown on the screen, involving young people using the courts to hold government to account for the effect of climate change, both for present and future generation. Cases filled on behalf of young plaintiffs connect future human rights violations to the presence by showing that people alive today will suffer the negative impacts predicted for 2050 and beyond. For instance, in the high, in the high profile ECT HR case against Portugal and 32 other states, the six, the six youth applicants allege not only the just violation of the right to life and right to privacy, but also discrimination against the youth on the basis that children and young adults are being made to bear the burden of climate change to a far, great, far greater extent than the older generations. The use from realization of human rights-based cases at a regional and national level, the relevance of such legal reasoning is not to be proven anymore. Especially since right-based climate change cases have a more, have a mobilizing power beyond the individual case concerned by building a narrative about the need for stronger action to tackle climate change, which increases public awareness. For WYCJ believed that the clarification by the highest judicial body of state's obligation related to human rights and climate change when it comes to intergenerational equity appears legally relevant and well-grounded, especially in order to unify, strengthen, and clarify its legal implications both at the international and domestic level. In doing so, it hopes to successfully impact high-level governance and utilizes this international tool of adjudication to influence and amalgamate to international legal regime. I will now give the floor to my colleague Robin that will develop the potential outcome of the AO for youth movement and climate justice. Yes, thank you so much, Manon. Um, so, and thank you to everyone for attending the webinar. Um, I realize we're on all different time zones, but it's great to be here wherever you are. And so just to briefly follow up on that, for those of us who work within the US legal system, I think the human rights framework can sometimes be a little bit jarring because so much of the human rights framework around climate litigation is really anchored in international law. Um, so for me, a lot of the climate work I've done in the US system is more anchored in tort law or securities law. So there's an ongoing case in Hawaii and a number of other states and municipalities right now, basically filing tort law claims against fossil fuel companies on theories of trespass and other kind of common law causes of action. And additionally, there's been a lot of movement within securities law in the United States, and this is something I've discussed in a number of my securities law classes at Yale, basically to incorporate climate risk. And that is, so there's a number of really exciting climate litigation pathways that we're seeing emerge, but the emergence of the human rights framework actually in US domestic law is something that's very encouraging to those of us who worked in this for a number of years. Um, notably, on the slide we're just on, minors of POSA v. Factorin, which is not well known in the US, was 
arguably one of the first cases to really establish an intergenerational right to a healthy environment. And that case was in the mid 1990s in the Philippines. Um, Antonio Posa, who's been a wonderful advisor to our campaign for many, many years, brought a suit against the government of the Philippines on behalf actually of his own children. Um, this was an extremely bold action in a time when old growth logging threatened to essentially eliminate old growth forests in the Philippines. And he successfully argued that his children and other future generations had a right for these forests to exist. So this case over the decades has inspired Juliana of US, arguably one of the most famous um, rights of future generations cases in the US system. Although I should mention that our Children's Trust has also brought state level lawsuits in a number of states around the US as well. And they also had a very successful tutela or a special constitutional action in Colombia as mentioned on this slide and in a number of international jurisdictions as well. Um, the graphic you speak of is from an event with uh, Julia Olson of Our Children's Trust before the pandemic, which seems very long ago to us now, but that is a case that is still continuing as well and has, uh, I would say, a fair bit of momentum. So our campaign essentially seeks to establish clear legal standards for climate action and international law. Um, so my colleagues, as discussed, there is broad human rights precedent throughout the UN system. Recently, as um, Manon mentioned, the right to a healthy and safe environment was recognized at the international level, which is very encouraging. And New York State and other states within the US have also taken up potentially enshrining the right to a healthy environment into their constitutions as well. And additionally, if you look um, beyond solely the UNFCCC and the other kind of climate governance framework within the UN, there's actually a lot of recognition of the impact of climate change and human rights. So Himat mentioned that we're starting to see a disproportionate impact on women and children in many parts of the world. And the Lima Work Program on Gender under the UNFCCC and um, General Recommendation 37 under CEDAW, the UN's Banner, Banner International Human Rights Treaty for Women, have actually explicitly recognized the impact of climate change on women. So there's actually a very broad array of legal authority and that our campaign has been looking into over the years outside of solely climate and environmental law, which is very exciting. So essentially, we are hoping to pull together some of these past human rights precedents, either in domestic courts or in other international human rights law, and sort of settle what is the actual legal standard for duties to, um, to future generations. So our campaign, partly because of the influence of Antonio Posa and other lawyers who've worked on theories for its future generations for many, many years, is really focused on intergenerational equity. And for me as a law student, it's been very empowering to work with younger students. I have been involved in this campaign for many years now, since my first year of law school. And I think there's been so much excitement, especially from younger students, actually, who um, we have a number of students who are not lawyers, are not law students, but are just really, really passionate about this initiative. And they've seen what cases like Juliana of the US and other suits internationally can do to really raise awareness and galvanize the youth climate movement. Additionally, we believe that RAO, if successful, would provide strong legal precedent on the issue of integration of human rights, international environmental jurisprudence. So as Manon mentioned, there's been so much movement to really recognize the human rights impacts of climate change in addition to the ecological and other impacts. And we think that this would be a way to further bridge that gap. Additionally, an advisory opinion could bring legal clarity to and progress in international diplomatic endeavors. So it could, although it's not legally binding, um, AOs carry tremendous moral weight. And this has been recognized by jurists really throughout the UN system. So we're hoping that this could provide kind of a favorable anchor for future negotiations or even other domestic litigation um, as previously mentioned. Additionally, the opinion could set the terms of the debate and shape public consciousness by defining normative expectations for a broad variety of actors, um, basically, again, influencing states. And it signifies uh, the importance of the opinion would have on developing the international environmental legal regime. So we have a wide range of supporters, as I mentioned, really throughout the UN system. Uh, Mary Robinson and a couple UN special rapporteurs have lent their voices to our campaign, which we're immensely grateful for. And we also have an advisory group of experts um, with climate law laid in uni, uh, Kate Dews of the International Committee on the World Court Project, 
who secured an AO from the ICJ on the issue of Duke, um, nuclear weapons disarmament. So again, this feels like so long ago now, but I remember a few years ago before the pandemic, we were talking to a few folks who had worked on that AO campaign, uh, which essentially was following a similar trajectory as ours. They managed to get through the General Assembly and have the International Court of Justice issue an advisory opinion on essentially the human rights implications of nuclear weapons. Additionally, um, Willie Misak of the National Biodiversity and Conservation who's a National Biodiversity and Conservation Specialist at FAO in Vanuatu, Kiefer Jackson, Corporate Legal Officer for the Guyana National Shipping Corporation Limited, an external evaluator for the National Accreditation Council of Guyana, and Matthew Hilton, uh, who's a specialist in media and communications. Um, we are always, if you're interested in joining our campaign, we are always open to having more senior attorney advisors and also um, students of any age are really welcome to join as well. And I just wanted to close kind of by lifting up this quote from Antonio Aposa, and we're hoping to save some time for Q&A as well. Um, but basically, talking to Tony in person when he was in New York, it was really kind of um, meeting him during 1L when I was learning like all this somewhat rote black letter law was just such an interesting perspective because he really sees law and some other senior advisors do as well, they really see law in a different way. So to him, the beauty of a legal action is it lights a star. If you tell a story in a court of law, people begin to listen. So the goal of this campaign is not simply to reach the ICJ or secure a concrete legal outcome, but also to really galvanize and inspire youth around the world. And we've seen a really tremendous outpouring of support the past few years. I remember this campaign when it was um, basically just extremely grassroots in New York, knocking on doors, meeting with permanent representatives of those countries, and to see so many inspiring young people join the past few years from all over the world. Um, our panel today is in all different time zones, has been a really inspiring journey. And although it can be difficult sometimes to work in climate law, and I know many of us were discouraged by some of the outcomes from COP26, I think seeing the momentum this campaign has, um, has given me tremendous hope. So I will close, um, unless any of my co-panelists want to add anything, um, you can find us on social media, reach out to us if you'd like to be involved in the campaign, and I will open up to Q&A. Uh, thank you again all for coming. Yeah, thank you all so much. That was a really great presentation. Um, your movement is really cool. Um, if anyone has questions, um, the Q&A is still open. So anyone should feel free to you know, submit your thoughts or any questions that you might have for our panelists. Um, in the meantime, I was kind of curious, um, you guys were talking about um, how sort of you were, one of the approaches was using like a discrimination framework against youth. Um, I was wondering if there was any, um, if, there was any, if anyone was using also the framework of discrimination um, based on, you know, location near the equator or being south of the equator, because I know a lot of, of the biggest polluters in the world, like the US, for example, are in the global north. I think a number of the countries that have taken a leading role in this campaign are from the global south. Um, so as we mentioned, Pacific Island Students Fighting Climate Change has been a real driving force behind this campaign. And additionally, many of the national governments that have been interested over the years are um, small island within the Small Island Developing States Group at the UN as well. Um, it's interesting, actually, before the pandemic, I was talking to some other country representatives, and there are actually other countries outside the SIDS group who see themselves as similarly situated um, to Pacific Island nations because of the concerns of sea level rise. So I think especially as we're seeing this potentially move into the General Assembly, it'll be, I think there will be maybe a broader coalition of allies, um, which is exciting. And then how, um, what are sort of some of the mechanisms to get some of the, the larger polluters to sort of comply with the advisory opinion? Is it more about creating pressure or are there other um, sort of mechanisms at play as well? Um, so as Robert mentioned earlier, with um, with the support of not just the SIDS, but like we we are hoping that a campaign moves in a certain way where a lot of global south countries, because the majority of the votes will come from the global south, and that would be hopefully would 
maybe reach like up to 193 as we want it. So um, there would be a massive support from there. And um, at COP and even at a few other conferences, we have noticed that a few countries um, from the global north, like going into the divide, have also shown, uh, like governments have shown support and uh, have, um, have been interested in how this, um, what exactly the question is going to be. Also, it really depends on how the question is negotiated at the UNGA, because that really depends on states and their relations. So what we hope to do is that we um, we want to create, create this uh, platform or sort of mine data uh, for before this happens, before the question is tabled at the UNGA, so states do have information of what where the court might till into or incline to depending on what sort of question is asked because that is what happened with palau all also that right? the the right question was not asked by right question meaning that the icj or the unj not the not the icj did not go to the icj but the unj uh did think like the states at the unj did think that it was um a question which had some sort of political adversity because it was asking um, obligation was asking to clarify obligations of states that polluted and harmed other states. So there was a lot. There was um, there was a question of the preventive harm principle, and so that is the reason we are trying to avoid that and moving to a rights based approach, so that this is something that we can establish. This is something that um, that sort of creates a platform. Um, into dwelling into the principle of intergen intergenerational equity, intragenerational equity, perhaps depending on how the question is, maybe even differential, uh, common but differential responsibility and um, respective capabilities. But that again depends on what exactly the question is asked, uh, how it is asked, and what negotiations have happened at the UNJ. And Himat rightly mentioned it is a pro political process, it's a bureaucratic process. So what we can do is just push as much as we can from our side. All right, thank you for that answer. Um, we have an audience question um, from Kathy Ging. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, I have been, uh, Kathy says, I have been a renewable energy advocate since the mid seventies. In retrospect, I recognize failure to switch to 100% public power owned utilities was a major organizing flaw. Thoughts? Um, I directed or co-coordinated 25 renewable energy events um, in Oregon and initiated new solar energy, revised personal income tax credit for renters owners in Oregon in the last 30 years, um, et cetera. Um, also, what is your opinion on radiation emitting um, microwave wireless smart meters? Um, I don't know if you all can see the question too. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of words in it. Um, so maybe if anything in it like draws a response from you, feel free to respond to any of it. Um, can y'all can y'all see the question? You can just nod if you can oh, see yeah. it. Okay. Uh, so because I'm based in the U.S., I have maybe a little more experience with U.S. energy law. Um, so again, the impacts of our campaign on U.S. domestic policy is somewhat unknown. The U.S. typically, at least since the early 2000s, explicitly has not recognized the international court system. So there is kind of a hope that the campaign can galvanize um, renewable energy and other efforts within the United States, but it's a little more of an indirect connection than for countries that explicitly recognize the authority of the ICJ. So I've worked um, on a lot throughout law school on community solar kind of in other projects. I was a research assistant for a book that was published recently on community solar in Puerto Rico and other environmental justice communities around the US. So I think there has been kind of more momentum in recent years. And also we've seen as the cost of some of these technologies come down. And I know many of my panelists have worked on a variety of other environmental law issues around the world. So unfortunately I haven't seen renewable energy take hold as much in the US as in some other countries, but I'm optimistic that we're kind of starting to see momentum shift. Um, additionally, uh, with possible health risks of some of these technologies, um, my family grew up in East Tennessee and I grew up seeing the impacts of mountaintop removal firsthand. So I think although there are potential risks with some of these same technologies, it's exponentially less than the forms of extraction we've seen historically. And also many forms of extraction we've seen historically, um, kind of to tie back to the justice theme of, 
our presentation had been concentrated within low income and marginalized communities within the United States and internationally as well. Um, so although kind of the emerging new clean energy framework may not be perfect, we're hoping that it'll be better and more equitable in some ways than what has come before. All right, thank you for your answer. Um, if anyone um, has any more questions, we could probably take one more. Otherwise, um, we probably want to um, close things out so we can give, oh, we do have another one from Professor Mary Wood. Um, thank you, Professor Wood, um, here at U of O. Um, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Could an advisory opinion also set forth a range of practical judicial, judicial um, remedies that could carry out the basic right as the court defines it? And um, could it comment on the political question doctrine and the role of the courts, even though these questions are unique to legal systems? If anyone um, wants to answer that, you can feel free. And so I think because um, political question doctrine is a little more specific to US law, um, it has been very discouraging to see that used to um, essentially throw out cases like Hubelina v. Exxon Mobil that had these very strong justice claims in the past. And we're hopeful that this campaign, if successful, would actually be a galvanizing force behind legislation and other branches of government, in addition to um, Juliana, supporting Juliana v. US and some of the other youth climate cases we've seen in the US. So I think there's a hope that um, potentially having a broader, again, like as um, Tony said, having a broader discussion around this case and sort of elevating consciousness and forcing a public discussion in some ways of the human rights impacts of climate change would provide more momentum for legislation and for other branches of government to act in addition to the courts. Um, but yeah, it is, it's definitely an open question, the impact this will have on US domestic law. And I know many of us in this space have also been watching um, West Virginia VPA unfold very anxiously as well. So it'll be interesting to see where um, US law goes within the next few years. Um, just to add to it, um driving away from uh, US, the US legal system, particularly what we, what I personally think is that there are a lot of constitutions that still do not recognize um, a right to a healthy or safe environment as part of their fundamental rights. So this is something that would maybe help initiate that conversation in those parts of, or those states. Um, uh, even though we do now see that there, that there is a trend of recognizing this sort of right as part of your human fundamental right that you are, you can take to court when it is breached. So um, uh, like for in, um, in, the, in, in the case of Legere versus Pakistan, as Manon mentioned, and even a few other Indian cases that I happened to uh, look at or like read or study about was that because this sort of right is a part of your fundamental right and can and violating this violating a fundamental right or a human right would would basically give you a direct locus, locus standi before your domestic court to ask for some sort of immediate relief or um, um, or um, or a, rem uh, or a le re legal remedy to rectify this is one thing that we hope to, uh, that we hope to see uh, more substantially throughout. Also, as Robin mentioned, that there would be a lot of legal legislative developments um, in domestic uh, courts and uh, sorry, uh, legislative developments um, in um, in these states that do not have a strong uh, recognition of environmental and human rights as fundamental rights. So um, that's another thing that we hope to say. And, um, and uh, like with youth coming forward and speaking and speaking about their rights and their impacts, uh, impacts that they have on their um, human rights, it would also be interesting to see uh, public interest suits and litigation that happen um, still happen uh, in quite a few states right now, but like an increasing um, in, in, an increasing uh, trend or an increasing curve to it, which ultimately will, uh, for cases of common law, will be a precedent or will um, will will be treated as uh, a precedent depending on what sort of um, issue is raised in those cases. So. These are things that we would like to see happen. Um, also, coming coming to the advisory opinion, 
uh, not being legally binding or uh, affecting um, uh, state legislation is that we could see what happened after the nuclear case, a uh, nu nuclear case advisory opinion. There was a massive uh, sort of um, um, movement towards uh, towards it. So this is something that we would see also uh, an overlap between these two separate uh, operative uh, systems or like uh, like disciplines of international law. So yeah, that's one. That's another thing that I would like to add in. Sorry, I just wanted to add a, just a short comment. I was I just wanted to say that what we seek with the advis uh, advisory opinion is more to create a basis and the first step towards recognition and the implementation of such uh, human rights linked with climate change. Um, whether or not the court is going to describe very with a greater detail it will be implemented and what, is, what are the impacts that it will, it will have on domestic law. Unfortunately, it's not up to, to us, it's up to the judges. But it's, we, we, we hope that even though uh, the details might not be described, because it, it might happen, the impact of such advisor, advisory opinion on domestic law and international law in general, we then we, we described by other courts around the world and implement and give roots and strength to this um, to this new new right for climate justice and intergenerational equity. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would just like to thank our panelists one more time. Um, I definitely learned a lot here. So I really would like to thank you all for coming in from different time zones, different parts of the world um, to educate us today. Um, I would also like to thank everyone in our audience for showing up. Um, you know, for those of us on Pacific time showing up a little bit early. Um, so yeah, I hope everyone really enjoys the rest of Pilk and that you all have a lovely rest of your weekend. Take care. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you. Thank you for Thank today. Thank you. Have a, have a great end of your day.